So here we are in the weeds at uh, the Canadian Society of Plant Science, the Canadian Federation of Plant Sciences meeting. And it looks like we have a great day ahead of us. Looking forward to Dr. Jolie and Dr. Punja's talks uh, following this on uh, pests and, and pathogens in cannabis. So I'll be scribbling notes furiously. We have things to, to discuss. And um, you've been gave an excellent introduction. So cannabis is um, the most lucrative crop ever grown. Humans have taken this plant around just about every place we have gone. And last year in Canada, it was a $4 billion industry alone. And like no other plant, cannabis produces hundreds of uh, secondary metabolites, among which THC and CBD are the most sought after for their therapeutic efficacy. At least as it stands um, now, the majority of medical uh, cannabis production is occurring in indoor controlled environments. Uh, a lot of the times greenhouses, uh, other times they're proper indoor facilities that are, are fully uh, light emitting diodes or, or supplemental uh, high pressure sodium lighting. Uh, almost ubiquitously though, in greenhouses and indoor environments, soilless media is used and this typically comes in the realm of rock wool. So roven, woven stone, literally co uh, <laughs> collected from the earth, uh, or peat that is uh, derived usually from Quebec or Ontario, and uh, and then uh, a lot of synthetic salt-based fertilizers are are applied in in cannabis production. So a great place if we're going to unravel and disentangle the, the things that govern the growth and physiology of cannabis, uh, we, we should really be looking at these root zone environments and, and comparing them. And within the root zone environment, um, quite uh, commonly in the realms of plant sciences, as most of you here already know, it's the physical properties like surface area, porosity, the particle size that are mediating the chemical interactions. So the exchange of ions, uh, whether they're cationic, anionic, uh, pH, the uh, uh, proportion of, of hydrogen, the buffering or liming ability of the, the substrate, and then the actual biological organisms that live within that matrix uh, on top of all of those interactions. And I'd like to leave you all here today with thinking more about the deep history and, and the biology of the plant, uh, in addition to asking the basic questions. So I want you all to become a cannabis, a drug type cannabis to feed the plant, and we're going to go back to the origin, ancestral habitat of, uh, of cannabis. So you are a uh, Lamarckian uh, indica. You're growing at the top of the Himalaya uh, Kush Mountains, and you are struggling for existence. And uh, you have some ecologic problems. Uh, you're the occupant of uh, <laughs> infertile, xeric, dry soils. They are acidic coming at you is a tremendous mess of photons of various strengths, intensity, and the day length is short. So a little further downstream and a little longer in the span of time, you're still a cannabis plant. You have gone downstream, one of the major uh, riparian systems, and on those systems, you're more equatorial. The day length is more consistent, it is more humid, it's hotter on average. The soil or root zone matrix looks very different and applied three different treatments of root zones. So your standard hydroponics, uh, three gallon pot with the uh, MJ line of the uh, appropriately named mineral fertilizer, and you can see denoted at the bottom of the slide there that uh, relative stoichiometry, concentration of minerals dissolved in that effluent, 
really interested in just the f uh, floral phase, that flowering reproductive phase of growth. Um, vegetative increase will drive uh, reproductive patterns, but it really is during this uh, window of reproduction where the magic of the cannabis plant occurs. So the two other treatments were uh, or organic based uh, aquacultural, the effluent applied to the three gallon uh, pot, growing in a pot, <laughs> and of course the aquaponics, which was uh, the standard system we use at Green Relief. So those plants are literally floating on a river. You can think of the conceptual framework laid out uh, just previously, floating on, on the Ganges River of uh, organic effluent and just so it's clear um, a lot of the time these experimental studies are not balanced appropriately with the stoichiometry of the nutrients so in the aquaculture solution in the aquaponics uh, treatment we added uh, one fourth diluted of the standard mineral fertilizer to balance things out. And all plants were uh, subjected to the same light intensities. The these are the red blue light emitting diodes and the uh, PAR, the photosynthetically active radiation, was maintained relatively around 700 micromoles per meter square per second. Um, and each root zone system was replicated 20 times and then completely randomized uh, and randomized again throughout the experiment. So, uh, group, group of researchers, the, the botany team, uh, measured growth rates every week, uh, measured leaf level gas exchange parameters weekly as well, and then uh, harvested the biomass to get quantifiable yield and the uh, secondary metabolites, terpenes and cannabinoids, were sent off for uh, GCMS and uh, UHPLC analysis. We found significant uh, effects of root zone on growth traits, physiological traits, uh, nutrient acquisition, and uh, overall biomass yield. And yield is really the important thing that every cultivator is after. So notable is that the aquaponics and aquacultural effluent tea applied to the plants, there was really no differences uh, statistically, the analysis of variance on those two treatments, but overwhelmingly different was the hydroponic treatment. And as you can see in blue there, the uh, biomass of the hydroponic plants were much increased. What is interesting, and this gets into carbon economy and carbon allocation, is that the metabolite concentrations didn't differ, at least in the case of Nordal. Across the root zones, despite biomass, growth, and physiology differing drastically, hydroponic plants had about 40 to 70 percent higher nitrogen uh, from day 14 through to the end of harvest compared to the aquaponics and aquacultural tea. And likewise, that the hydroponic plants had uh, about 50% enhanced foliar um, potassium. And potassium is greatly important, is vastly important for osmotic interactions. It's what drives water. There's that proton pump uh, in the stomates. So, what we're seeing is the machinery for the plants to grow is operating more maximally under the hydroponic conditions, but for developmental biology reasons, phosphorus in the aquaponics treatment is greatly enhanced. And that might be the mechanisms for parsing out why secondary metabolites are significantly enhanced in aquaponics, yet yield is down, uh, because of nitrogen limitation. So this is just the, the foundation of what we hope will be uh, a lot further research. So an uh, interesting aspect that warrants much further investigation, but is certainly notable here, is that collecting the leachates, so you pour a bunch of water through the top of the pots and you collect the ionized chloride and, and sodium that, that comes out, you analyze it. 
we did see noticeable chlorosis in the aquaponics treatment. And so what does this all mean? Where does this leave us? Uh, what is the take home message for all of you here today? Well, we have empirical evidence for the long hypothesized uh, and, and probably to no surprise notion that root zones are indeed important for driving the ecophysiology of cannabis. Cannabis is such an expeditiously growing plant that we, we now have evidence in hand that it is vulnerable. It does succumb to the fluxes of, of the environment and importantly, root zone physical and chemical properties. Uh, effects were notably cultivar specific so uh, the type 1 and type 2 cultivars responded differently to the treatments, although in the same direction. Uh, just the chemical, the uh, metabolites produced, uh, was, was different. And so thinking about what are the mechanisms that explain these observed biomass and ecophysiological responses, we see greatly different nutrition through time, significant pH differences in hydroponics being uh, more acidic, and the uh, occupant resident plants floating amok, the aquaculture uh, and aquaponics treatments have uh, significant amounts of, of salt. So we know how um, arduous and incongruent um, it is to parse out all of the different parameters that drive plant growth. Uh, in fact, um, because of the plasticity and the sensitivity and the resource acquisition requirements of cannabis, it is greatly sensitive to difference, slight differences in, in the root zone. And uh, unlike a lot of uh, crops, wild plants, uh, trees, cannabis has uh, an order of magnitude more volatile compounds that it's producing. It's a growth machine. It um, has to decide to put carbon into actual structural building blocks or into producing those carbon-based uh, 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 cannabinoids and, and, and terpenes. And there's a, a carbon economy going on that, that's quite interesting. And because genetic differentiation and plasticity both jointly shape intraspecific variation, um, it is a, a less obvious a caveat that, that bears repeating that we do need to understand a lot more about the genomics um, to get at that. So I want to thank uh, the botany group uh, that I run at Green Relief, so Tim Moffitt, uh, working hand in hand with uh, Brandon. So Brandon was great working with our group. Dane Cronin is a graduate here from Brian Husband's lab. Uh, so he's he's a research scientist with us as well as uh, Craig LeBlanc and, and Kelly Sweeten um, who are uh, uh, propagation uh, employees that, that we have at Green Relief. And of course, thank you to Yubin. And uh, we look forward to hearing from Dr. Jolie and uh, uh, Dr. Punja on uh, <laughs> Uh, pithier uh, pathogens and, and diseases.